going to be moderated by Tayo Odunsi, CEO at Northcourt Real Estate. Please help me welcome to the stage, Tayo. Joining Tayo this afternoon, we have Abdul Hussein, Managing Director at Africa Works, Gabenga Olanian, CEO at Estate Links, Michael Aldridge, CEO at Kofisi Africa, Samantha Naidu, Commercial Property Specialist at APSA, Nicholas Lake, Account Executive of Sales at MRI Software, and Mark Dunford, Managing Director, Kenya Knight Friend. Please help me welcome the panels up to the stage. Thank you so much. We have eaten a little bit into our schedule, which we are on a little bit of a time crunch, but I will signal to you, Tayo. But before we allow our panelists to get into a discussion, just a short little video, if I could have your attention to the screen. Thank you. Nigeria, which is a giant of Africa, was in 2016 declared as having the largest economy in Africa. Lagos, which is a commercial nerve center of West Africa, has become a major hub for international business and services, and recently labeled as one of the most desirable investment destinations in sub-Saharan Africa. Rising above the skyline of this prestigious city is the first ever tri-tower building in West Africa, which is a unity of three towers combined into structural beauty and functionality. Trinity Towers is a unique and world-class development brought to the market with modern technology and state-of-the-art facilities. Carefully and futuristically conceived, it is an edifice which provides a sync between business, functionality, elegance and lifestyle. This meticulously designed mixed development of commercial, retail, hospitality and leisure space is located at the heart of the fast developing commercial centre of Veniru, Victoria Island, Lagos, Nigeria. Trinity Towers is a development of the RCCG City of David with a trademark of excellence, employing the services of ITV, contractors and consultants who are best in class. This multifaceted building is set to raise the bar of A-grade real estate in Nigeria. It is a state-of-the-art development with importance given to structural detail, all at a competitive rental price that is market-friendly. The iconic design, easily accessible location, Futuristic specifications and perfect blend of office and relaxation facilities sets a new standard for Nigeria's architectural landscape. The development boasts of over 13,000 square meters of contemporary real estate spanning 12 floors with multi-story car park for 670 cars, a 5,000-seater concert hall, other multi-purpose halls seating over 2,000. There is indoor amusement for children, shopping strip, two cinema halls, a gymnasium, helipad, games arcade, medical center, cafe and restaurant, banking halls, ATM gallery, and lots more. The development is within easy reach of Lagos financial, commercial, and residential environments and has neighbors such as Four Points by Sheraton, Lagos Oriental Hotel, Exxon Mobile Headquarters, the Palms Shopping Mall, Civic Center, Hard Rock Cafe and lots more. Trinity Towers offers a distinctive presence, thereby changing the skyline of Western Victoria Island. Welcome to a whole new experience of business and leisure from three towers in one elegant building, the Trinity Towers. This edifice is set to be the best and most functional building Nigeria has seen to date. For further details on how to be part of this dream by taking a space in the Trinity Towers, please contact the Estate Links Group or Knight Frank and Rutley, Nigeria on 0818-001-0000. The future is indeed here. Okay, um, very interesting project um, in Lagos. And uh, as I was discussing with uh, Benga when we were just waiting, uh, for those of us that attend uh, the West Africa Property Investment uh, Summit in November, you might be able to uh, visit that um, project in particular because we're looking at probably having a cocktail there. Um, good afternoon everyone. Uh, we have a big panel today and so we're going to be learning a lot. Um, conversation has started um, in the morning looking at different asset classes uh, within the real estate spectrum uh, but now we're going to be doing a deep dive into office 
um, you need to just have been in real estate, in, in, in the commercial real estate segment for about four years to know that um, office submarkets has significantly changed in the last couple of years. And I think um, there's no better panel to talk us through those changes and how um, both occupiers and uh, land and uh, property owners are navigating you know, those changes. Um, it's a very great panel, um, and I'll just be asking you kind of like a question to just stimulate um, you know, the conversation. Uh, so I'd like you to just introduce, I'll just go by every panel, starting with you, Samantha. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do. And in particular, um, just kind of highlight to us um, in you know, considering all the recent events that we've had in Africa and in the world, to be honest, um, consider economic headwinds, um, residuals from COVID, uh, climate change, energy cost rises. Um, how are this, how are all these changes impacting commercial real estate? How are um, land, how are landlords navigating this space? And you know, how are you seeing this affect your business in general? Thanks. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Samantha Naidu, and I'm from EPSA Commercial Property Finance. And we uh, provide bespoke financial solutions for commercial property finance in Africa. And, um, you know, answering the question about the energy crisis, I think whoever has that answer is probably going to be a gazillionaire, <laughs> you know, to be able to find the answer on how do we uh, uh, fix that. But what we're seeing on the continent um, is the accelerated adoption of technology, which has been absolutely positive coming out of COVID. And I'd like to keep that on you know, a more positive spin uh, because offices were really impacted um, through COVID. And in that we uh, you know, saw uh, uh, vacancies of about 10 to 20%, which is still not unusual. Those are the levels that we saw even pre-COVID. We are seeing some rental reversions, shorter lease tenors, um, legacy stock that uh, is still coming up, um, or it's, it's up, and that's where we see the rental reversions. But premium stock is still able to command, you know, the, the ra rates before COVID. Do you want to ask something? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'll just, okay. you, I'll give you some time to go over that again, but um, I'll just move on to Mark. Mark, Hello. how how are you navigating these headwinds um, in Night Frank in Kenya? Um, it's a good question. Our occupiers have differing views on office space going forward. I think largely depending on what their business is like. So certain businesses are very office centric and other businesses, particularly if you think about consultancy or advisory businesses, have taken a hard look or are taking a hard look at how much office space they actually need and how much remote working they can do. So, and, and we find ourselves in a, a really unique space in Kenya because we have a lot of global occupiers looking to come into the market. Their initial requirements were X. Now they're revising those downwards, potentially, because they have more remote workers. But at the same time, they want to grow their presence. So they're, they're, there's a real mixed bag in terms of occupiers. So um, it's, it's an interesting time to be, to be in the space. But certain occupiers have, have given up the office completely. And, and I'm talking about large international firms. And they haven't reduced their number of staff on the ground in Kenya. Um, and I even know a couple who have allowed their workers from the Middle East, uh, Dubai-based workers, to work remotely. And we've actually seen quite a lot of those firms coming into Kenya. We've had the highest number of work permits and special passes issued in Kenya in the last two years. The, every, every sort of month is a new record for number of, of expats coming to the market. So it's, it's a really complex question to answer. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it really depends on your industry. Great, great, very, very insightful. So it depends on the type of um, you know, tenant, um, if you're office centric or you know, advise your business, you might be working from home or doing a hybrid. Okay, Binga, what's um, your experience on your business, uh, estate links, and um, you can also speak for the Nigerian context. Yeah, um, thank you, Tayo. Um, maybe I should start by thanking the organizers for Put in the picture of a more good-looking guy <laughs> above my name, just in case anyone is wondering about the match. Uh, that's not me, but thank you so much. Uh, yeah, let's go to the question. <laughs> the, our situation is quite similar to most other parts of Africa. One key thing we have noticed post-COVID 
is that a lot more occupiers, I mean, there were quite a number of deals we were about to sign on just before COVID. And um, obviously, we don't even know if COVID is over, but we're, we're now learning to, you know, manage it. There was this particular client that I'll use as an example here, who had asked us to get 2,000 square meters, and this was uh, February before COVID hit Nigeria in March. And when we went back to him a year and a half later, instead of moving to 1,500 square meters, he was now requesting that we help to sublet 500 out of the 1,000 square meters he had because uh, they, they were in an industry where a lot of their staff could work from home. So we are basically seeing a lot of this, and I'm sure during the conversation, we would be able to discuss what most of us are able to do to assist our clients and even occupiers at the same time. Thank you so much, Benga. Very interesting example you used there. All right, I'll move very quickly to Michael. Um, what's the case with Kofisi? Great, thanks again. Thanks for having us here. Um, I'm Michael Aldridge. I founded Kofisi, which is a shared workspace provider. Um, we've got quite an array of um, talent here. So in terms of our space, we shared workspace means where companies are coming together to use a single location and they're sh making uh, use of shared facilities between them. We do that, we're a multi-country, multi-center provider uh, with a focus very much on enterprise solutions. Um, I think uh, we're unashamed to say this, is, this has actually been a great time for us. Um, it's been a, uh, it's a very dynamic time for, for shared workspace. Uh, more companies are now engaging with this kind of model. Uh, every day we get more and more inquiries. And I think to sort of understand that, we've got to, what we've got to do is connect some dots. Um, you know, on average, the ind an individual is going to spend 90,000 hours in a lifetime in a workspace. Okay, and then we're combining that with an idea of a permanent blurring now between your home life and your work life, which has meant that companies needed to think about how they operate. And then when you add into the mix social media and that exponential education that comes from seeing what everyone else has, that's created a really fertile um, requirement and, and uh, uh, environment for change. And, and, and we've needed new, uh, new solutions to be able to give people the comfort that they have at home, for them to be able to have fingertip access to facilities, but also to have the connectivity with their, with their fellow workers. And Shared Workspace gives us that, which is why it's such a brilliant and simple solution. Um, it gives access to amazing facilities, enormous return on investment for companies who, who want to have better space by having to invest less money themselves, um, using experts to actually deliver much more sophisticated spaces for happy, and gi gives you happy staff. So um, the adoption rates are definitely happening. Global, globally, shared workspace has grown enormously. We, we grew 40 42% during the COVID period, which is quite something actually, and we're quite proud of that. Um, but it's definitely happening, it's here to stay. I think shared workspace is the platform of now, but I think really it's the platform of the future. Awesome, so perhaps um, uh, Benga's clients needed more flexibility and then moved to Kofisi space. It's taking our business. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. We can still work together in other ways. All right, Nicholas, um, I, I'm particularly excited to have you on this panel because you bring um, a different perspective. Um, Nicholas, you lead MRI Real Estate Software, um, which offers um, technology solutions to uh, commercial real estate. How has your business changed in the last couple of years? Thanks, thanks for that question. Um, so I'm Nicholas Leck. I look after the occupier division and the occupier solutions within Africa. Um, Big changes happened, obviously, as a result of COVID. And what we found was everyone was working from home. I mean, I'm stating the obvious here because everyone's in property. But from that move from office back to home, everyone realized that they could do meetings via Teams or via whatever online channel. And um, it really did shift the mindset and what actually happened is people realized what technology can do for you. Um, but it doesn't take away 
from the fact that you need an office space if you're a corporate occupier. Um, two key priorities that we've realized in, in corporate occupier space are health and safety and the information around that. That's a key priority for your property managers, your portfolio managers, as well as you know, having more data to inform your decisions around talent retention. And this is where the shared office space really provides some interesting you know, opportunities in the market. Awesome. We're going to be having more conversations about health and safety and technology, and I'm sure you'll be able to shed light on that. OK, um, not last but not least, Abdul, um, you're also in the co-working business, uh, primarily in Cape Town. Uh, what's your experience been um, in the last couple of years? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so just to reiterate what Michael has said, um, we're in a very similar uh, position where the shared space offering, so Africa Works, we are co-working space. In the last few years, we've seen a demand coming to us um, and mainly from uh, different companies. COVID has obviously diverted companies to go um, to cost saving and therefore they are now utilizing shared space. Um, the offering for businesses are mostly that they don't have to uh, spend monies on the, 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 the commercial space and kit out the commercial space, whereas if they go into this shared space, um, it's a shared cost, and for that is a cost saving to them, and that has been important, hence the demand um, in the industry for shared space. Um, Michael has mentioned it all from there, um, and that's why we've seen the influx coming from small businesses to big businesses coming to the shared space area. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Abdul. All right, Samantha, I mean, just considering everything everyone has said on this panel today, definitely there's been some big shifts. Um, but we've also realized and agreed that uh, we still need to work out of offices. But the big question is, what are the new leasing, financing terms, structures? Do they still look the same way? Or are there some big shifts that we need to know? Thanks. So. The leases, definitely we've seen a change. We've seen much shorter leases, a lot more conversation happening between tenants and landlords uh, to be able to provide some form of concession, be flexible in that. And so as financiers, we've also had to pivot. We've also had to look at how do we respond to these changes. And we've been able to provide really flexible and bespoke uh, financial structures to respond to that. One of the recent transactions that we've done was the hard currency lending to office and corporate accommodation in Maputo. And our ability to raise funding outside of a geography that is very difficult to raise um, hard currency, we were able to do that through Mauritius um, and our subsidiary in Mauritius. So we were able to respond to it. And even through COVID, um, the bank has been able to also respond positively um, so that our clients don't feel the hurt uh, through what was happening uh, in COVID. And we also are quite familiar with uh, green funding structures because we're seeing a lot of ESG coming through. And so those bespoke funding structures will have ESG um, elements attached to it and there's a benefit to the client, also benefit to the bank. Mm. Um, and where we see capital flowing as well is, um, you know, outside of uh, Africa is from um, or into uh, Africa at least, is from DFIs and private investors. And they're looking for ESG. They're lo looking for um, assets that have ESG, that have sound property fundamentals, that have sustainability. And um, the resilient property types that we're looking at is things like light industrial and uh, corporate accommodation, residential, and data centers. I think that's the, the, that's been a big the thing. sweetheart uh, yeah. <laughs> at the moment. But even in that, we've also seen our uh, clients you know, repurposing existing assets, repurposing it and making it into shared spaces, and being able to even make it, some of them into residential. So it really is being able to pivot into what's going to happen in the future, how to make your business sustainable for the future. Thanks. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, um, Mark, um, I mean, Knight Frank represents a lot of developers in, in, in Kenya, and uh, some definitely more successful than others. Well, perhaps all your clients are successful, but speaking about Kenya in general, office developers, the ones that are getting it right, what are they doing right? And the ones that are not getting it so right, what are they doing wrong? 
Yeah, good question. Um, not all our clients are successful, unfortunately. <laughs> we try to help them as much as possible, but they don't all listen. I think, uh, you know, following on what Samantha was saying, going forward and, and some of the newer buildings already have the green building element and the green energy piece as part of their kind of DNA. And I, that's obviously now essential to international occupiers. The other piece of advice that I believe my team are giving to, <laughs> to their clients is that we should be creating buildings that are as uh, future-proof and flexible as possible. So, you know, listening to the type of tenants we want to occupy those buildings in advance, benchmarking against not just local comparables, but international comparables. I'm always harping on about going to places like Dubai or even coming here to Joburg to look at what big tenants occupy here, because if we can create a solution in market that is similar to what they already occupy, then you're more likely to get them in your market, right? So listening to, to international occupiers, if that's who you want in your building, which most people do, because typically it de-risks you from a Forex perspective, uh, the green element and then flexibility to kind of future-proof are all really key. I think something that a lot of owners are struggling with, and, and this is not new, I mean, any market around the world has, has had this issue, is what to do with the grade B stock. When the grade A stock comes onto the market and tenants move into the newer stuff, what then happens with that older stock? And that's where this kind of future-proofing and ability to morph your building into, whether it's flex space or, or something else, um, is, is really valuable. Nice, nice, interesting. Thanks for sharing those points. Uh, Binga, and perfect example is uh, your building that you just showed us, uh, Trinity Towers. Is mixed use essentially becoming a hedge, right? Uh, in the sense that having multiple uses and then being able to attract multiple levels of demand and not just being, you know, um, 13, 18 floors of office. Is, is it becoming a trend? Uh, occupiers beginning to occupy, uh, to demand uh, mixed-use assets? Um, you know, in every country, you need to look at the cultural element. Um, you know, this concept, leave, work, play. I would say what we have found is that in Nigeria, people want to work and play in the same place but then you want to finish everything you're doing there, and then you go home. So we have come to discover that, for instance, if you were to do a Melrose in Lagos, you would most likely not find too many people who want to leave in the same neighborhood as so many offices. And it's just a cultural thing. For instance, we had this client who was looking at Trinity Towers, and Trinity Towers, at the initial stage, had a residential element. But we found out that a lot of the demand, even when we were at the foundation stage, was for offices, restaurants, you know, play zones, and stuff like that. So the architect, of course, this is why we always say it's important to have a flexible design. The architect had to convert all the residential spaces in the building to commercial spaces. And this has actually turned out right because most of the tenants we have gotten that we have signed on, the first question they ask is if there would be a residential element. And to add to that, there's a 4,500 capacity concert hall. And that is also a problem for quite a number of uh, the tenants so the architect also had to tweak the design to ensure that um, they had entirely different entrances and exits. And at the same time, to ensure that you don't even meet each other at the parking spaces. So what we have found is that what works in a particular climb does not work in another. And I remember someone asked me a question that, listen, Lagos is congested. In fact, it's not just congested, is the most congested city in Africa in a good way, uh, followed by Nairobi, I think Cairo, before Pretoria. So you would normally think that most people would want to leave 
where they work. But instead of wanting to live where they work, they want to live within 10 minutes of where they work. So yes, the mixed use concept is starting to kick in there, but people are happy to have their offices where they eat, where they bank, where they watch movies, but they want to live elsewhere. Very interesting, very interesting um, deductions you've made. And uh, I, I never knew that Lagos was the most congested city in a good way. I, I, I don't know how In Africa. In, in Africa. It, oh, in, it, no. it, I, I didn't know that good way part, but <laughs> good, to, good to know. Um, I'll, I'll move on to you, uh, Michael. Um, so, I, I mean, I have some experience with co-working, and I can remember back in the day, it was always difficult to get landlords, you know, to, to offer up their space, you know, for shared office and, and all of that. It's, do we see that changing? And also, how are we seeing um, larger corporates, internationals, engaging with share of, shared office spaces, you know, as a commercial real estate uh, yeah. class? No, it's good. It's a good question. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think it's right to ask the question about both sides of the equation because it isn't just about the occupiers, it's about the landlords. And um, going back to COVID, uh, this giant home working experience, uh, experiment that happened across the globe, it certainly accelerated persuasion for us. We, we certainly had open ears to, to new ideas, which actually helped us in terms of some of the discussions we were having before because landlords were suddenly faced with a lot of empty space and companies were left um, in boardroom discussions about do, you know, how do we actually consider our office now? What, what kind of an asset is this? Is it an asset or is it a service? So definitely things move forward. But um, in terms of, I think there are three drivers that, 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 that have affected things. One has been education, um, which that's what the COVID, uh, COVID experience actually gave us was a fast track to helping people understand that it, that it made sense to, to look at another way to work. Um, quite often businesses don't really understand that shared workspace, shared workspace actually works at every stage in the evolution. I think people used to think about it as that's the way you start and then we end up at the trophy asset. Sorry, I'm, I'm now going to take Mark's business away from him as well. But, but, it's, um, but, the, but the fact is it works all the way along because business doesn't go up or down. It, it, it goes, in a, it goes in, a, in a sort of roller coaster pattern as, as every entrepreneur knows. And so um, it works at every stage. And it's a better experience for people and more cost effective. I think that's the main point. Um, I think we persuade the CFOs that it did make more sense, especially if you're, as a small company, um, as we've all been, you're, you're accessing millions of dollars of capital expenditure that you could never, you could never possibly get to. Um, and then as a large company, you can take, you don't have to carry this liability on your balance sheet under new IFRS scenarios. Um, and if you think about this, the enormity of a project to open, you know, five to 10,000 square foot space, you're only putting 10% of your cash into um, a, a position with a shared workspace operator versus a million plus dollars that you might have to do with fit out. So I think education was a big part of this. Um, second of all, um, was opportunity. And I think this is where the landlords come in because uh, landlords are now sort of realizing that um, you can actually access a wider variety of leads by having an operator in your building because you can pick up the smaller pieces that you wouldn't want to subdivide spe floor space for, um, as well as incubate the building for the bigger clients. So, you know, I think bigger providers globally um, that have had set the scene for this in terms of what was happening in America pre-COVID, um, in terms of tenant toe that comes from having those sort of brands, but it lifts the building generally. I mean, we're very proud of what we do with our interior design. It's highly sophisticated, and we believe that we add value to the building in that way. So I think it creates greater opportunity. Um, and finally, I suppose it's innovation, um, because business dies if we don't have innovation. Um, there are new facilities that can come into the, into the workspace. There's really no limit to the facilities that we could put in that would make sense to, to, to encourage people to stay. So it's a bit like we are saying about mixed-use developments. Um, and that's evolving, and it's, you're getting some really cool stuff that then you're getting access to. We have podcasting studios and media facilities. We have restaurants, bars, gyms, etc. So it's, it's, that's really great. As well as for the landlords, there's another way to make money. You know, um, you know, it's there's there's some good maths out there about how uh, joint venture models work, um, where landlords can actually make a bigger premium 
than they are on a standard let. So, you know, the old world is, 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 is dying away. And, and I think for, for these three reasons, um, we're, that's why we're seeing the acceleration and the change. Michael, you're making some very big statements there. And I'm just going to break the flow now and going to ask you, do you think in the near future, shared office is going to have a larger market share than Mark's, you know, standard office buildings? Uh, this, that was to me, sorry. Yeah, to you, so, to you, yeah, yes. to me, okay. So, um, <laughs> look, I, I, I think they're always going to go hand in hand. I, I, I okay. think um, the data is sort of suggesting that in every 10 floors, you're going to see two floors of operator. Right, okay. 20%, and that, that stat, that's quite exciting if you think about the African context though, because adoption rates in co-working in, and shared workspace in Africa is under 0.25% of, of commercial space at the moment, and it's near 15, 15 to 16% in developed environments. Uh, so um, it's faster here? No, it's, it's less. It's so, less. It's, so there's 30, 30 times growth just to catch up with the rest of the world, wow. and then it's gonna double, right? Okay. So you could probably see 25, 30%. But there's always going to be a scenario where people want standard conventional space. Okay, okay, great. All right, thank you. Thank you, thanks for the statements. Um, Nicholas, uh, so we've had a good conversation so far. What kinds of technology um, do you see, um, you know, operators deploying, you know, for office management? Um, for instance, artificial intelligence, space, ma space management tools, um, and the likes. Excellent question, thank you. I think, well, from our perspective, we see all sorts of technology being deployed. Um, I'd just like to touch on what Teo said earlier. It's all about flexibility. So, <clears throat> what, from a landlord and an occupier perspective, what you want is information that's gonna help you maximize your portfolio, right? Um, for example, little pucks that sit on your desk and show your presence. That will inform your business of your vacancy. Okay, how many people are actually coming to the office in real time? So that's some technology we have it deployed and, and we can see exactly who's in the office, who isn't. And that informs your decision on, um, ugh, you know, it's expensive. So you need to be sure about um, how much money you invest in your space. Um, the second thing that we've been looking at, I just want to touch on a study that we did recently from WorkTech Academy, it's available on our website, um, where we look at various different portfolio metrics, etc. Uh, and one of the key trends is space as a service. So we see the market going towards that without a doubt. Um, property managers, C-level executives, are looking at space as a service, and technology needs to support that. So naturally, we're developing technology that aligns with that. And something that we touched on earlier as well is ESG, um, energy management, being able to plug into devices that will feed back how much energy you're utilizing in real time. Things like that for your landlord and your tenants are, are extremely, extremely important. So we've covered that off and we have some fantastic technology in that space. Um, I could go on and on, artificial intelligence to read the leases, to help those lease administrators, because as you know, leases are becoming more and more complex uh, as, as risk needs to be shared between the landlord and the tenant. So uh, you, you need to stop me because I'll just carry on the whole day. Yeah, I, I actually have a following question in that. Um, and, and I, I just think that's the question a lot of people be asking is, how expensive is it to fit out um, office buildings with this technology? And how quickly do they kneel off and begin to be a value add? Look, it depends on the, on the scenario. We have you know, thousands of, of spaces per customer, uh, all the way down to smaller customers that maybe have two or three offices. Uh, so it varies dramatically, but uh, even the big implementations don't take very long. Um, we have methodologies, blueprints that allow you to roll those things out. From a cost perspective, uh, return on investment, you're looking at within a year. Yep. Fantastic. Fantastic. Very, very, very interesting. Um, and, 
you know, you touched on space as a service, and, and that just makes sense. I mean, uh, Michael had hinted that, you know, say two, two floors in 10, you know, will likely be co-working, and that's essentially offering space as a service, and they would need to use technology to be able to make those sorts of offerings. Um, Abdul, uh, I guess my question to you will be, if, if we take, say, 2020, 2022 as a block, and pre-2020 as another block, have the demographics and offerings you know, of co-working operators, have they changed between these two time blocks? Um, I would say yes, it has changed. I mean, obviously we needed to adjust um, and become a bit more flexible. Um, oh, so co-working has even become more flexible. I thought more you were flexible, already flexible. Yes. I mean, <laughs> we've become more flexible because we had to accommodate um, these smaller businesses. So, you know, you would find your daily packages, you'll find weekly packages, you would find monthly packages, you know, virtual offices, business address registration. So those are the things that we had to adjust to, uh, to become more flexible and accommodate the smaller businesses. Um, and hence the offerings has obviously attracted uh, more people to the co-working spaces and once they've come into the co-working space and there's a potential for growth They would opt to grow within your space um, and, and, and yeah, so flexibility very important um, To the uh, co-working Awesome, awesome. That's that's very interesting. That's lots of flexibility. Okay, we'll just take a last round of questions and if there's time we could potentially take questions from um, you know, from the floor. Uh, Samantha, uh, I want to have a conversation, just short conversation on ESG. You touched on this uh, before. Uh, ESG concentrations are becoming even more prevalent uh, within commercial office markets and uh, what's, what's driving this trend and where do you see this trend you know, essentially going? So I definitely think it's the um, shared office space, but I do want to actually just say to, I think it's Michael, um, in terms of uh, shared spaces and it becoming collabora uh, you know, collaborative, please, if we can keep the washrooms traditional and not collaborative, we don't need to be collaborating <laughs> on the washrooms, because I was at an uh, opening yesterday and it was quite an interesting view on um, collaborative spaces and we definitely need to you know move into that space because uh, I think Nicholas and I were uh, reading the same uh, Forbes article that talks about how do you attract and retain talent um, you know and coming back into the office and the words that they used in there was the offices uh, well office is a destination on steroids so you need to think about how to reinvigorate how to reignite um, you know collaboration and uh, um, just working together, innovation and co-creation. Um, in terms of the sustainability, and I think that's the biggest thing out of the ESG, um, you know, it's looking at how can property owners, property uh, developers and investors look at uh, a rate of employability of local skill, what's the transferability of skill to youth and to women, um, to also look at what is the impact before during and after development, and uh, you know, inclu including as many green elements as possible. It is difficult to balance that because of cost, but if you can see the cost benefit of doing it now uh, for the long term, for the sustainability, I think that will uh, keep business in good stead. Awesome, Thanks. awesome. So should be collaborative, but keep the bathrooms traditional. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Mac, you actually touched on you know, some of the things what I want to ask, but okay. going into the future, um, what, kind of, what kind of strategies do you think uh, you know, developers, office developers, uh, what kind of strategies should they be adopting? Should they be doing what uh, Wayne Guy is doing, doing more mixed use? Should they absolutely fast track and get two floors as co-working out of 10, like Michael has suggested? Um, what should they be considering? Yeah, again, you know, if you're a, a developer with a site or multiple sites, it's that question of do you specialize on a specific piece of land or do you hedge and create that mixed use product? It really depends on the market, where you are specifically within each city or node and what else there is within the market. I mean, if, if you're surrounded by vacant grade A office buildings, don't build another one. So. You know, there's a, there's a lot to that. I think on the flex, 
I, I mean, whatever you want to call it, um, instant office, flex space, whatever, I think that's a really exciting uh, asset class is, is the wrong word, but a segment within the office space going forward because a lot of these global tenants we see coming into market have long lead times on their decision processes, but they want to be here now. So they need, and they don't want to commit to a five, six year lease and have that on their books. I mean, in fact, even from my perspective, you know, I, I took over in uh, sort of six months ago and, and actually we have a number of office leases that were signed just before I took over that I wish we hadn't signed because now we're stuck with them for six years. So, you know, that ability to come into a space immediately without any long-term commitment, grow within that space if you need to, and then all alongside look for your own building, develop your own building, whatever it is, for a longer-term investment. I think that's really valuable, and we're seeing a lot of tenants come into the market looking for that, and at the same time, you're de-risked by local occupiers, smaller kind of startups or, or local businesses that need office space and again don't want to commit to five six years because they don't know if they're going to be around or how it's going to go and so on and so forth so you know i've had first-hand experience in nairobi of, of moving into a regis office with you know two people and then we grew we ended up with 12 people in the same regis we just grown 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 um and then downsized again so it, i think flex is, is super exciting in terms of diversifying mix on a single site it really depends on on the project and the, and the locality Okay, great, great. Um, Benga, from, from a Nigerian perspective, I, I don't think we'll have done a proper office panel if we don't talk about energy costs. Now, for those of you that don't know, energy prices in, in Nigeria have grown by, is it two, three hundred percent in the last, say, six months? Um, and on one hand, potentially making uh, A grade and more institutional office less attractive uh, because your Officially, your rent costs have skyrocketed. Um, but, Benga, how, uh, how are um, operators handling this? Um, what innovative solutions are they putting in place to, to manage this uh, dilemma? How many hours do I have? <laughs> <laughs> give, yes. give us the executive uh, summary. For those from Nigeria here, this is a major, major, major problem. And I tell you, we have become experts in running A-grade buildings with power cuts. And I say this, that if this was a lovely facility like this in Nigeria, you would not have noticed the power cuts this morning. South Africa is just learning from it, and I think I should come give you a lecture. <laughs> because um, it is a serious issue in Africa. In Nigeria in particular, uh, when we're going to have power cuts, nobody's warned. You could have six in a day. You could have three in a day. Sometimes you have power for four days. Now, every single building worth its salt has a minimum of two generators. Most people have three. So you have the generator, you have the standby, and then you have the standby standby in case the standby gen goes bad. And honestly, it does happen. The question now is, how do the tenants handle this? What we have found is the cost of energy when you switch to a generator is four and a half times the cost of energy from the public grid. And between, I would say, in the last 19 months, we have seen diesel move up by 300%. So you now find that for a tenant in an A-grade building, his energy costs could be as high as 40%, sometimes 50% of his total outlay for occupying that space. So yes, we have talked about the problem. Now the solution, because tenants still have to be in buildings. Uh, what we have noticed, first of all, is that for those who are able to cope, or those who do not mind, a number of people are moving to B-grade buildings, and this is because in a B-grade building, you are likely to have your generator on between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you come to work after 6 p.m., you better hold a lantern because that's the way it works. So we have found a number of tenants who are ready to compromise quality moving to B-grade properties. 
But for those who have remained, a lot of owners and operators are looking at renewable energy. We all know that one of the challenges of solar is the capacity to carry, for instance, a property that requires 500 kVA of electricity and some 1,000. So if there's anyone looking to invest in there, please, you have a partner here, because honestly, that is a major challenge. What a lot of operators are doing now, uh, I would say previously, before the last two years, what most people running uh, service charges would do is to just spread the entire cost, security, cleaning, diesel, across board based on the square meterage you occupy. But now that a lot of tenants are grumbling, a lot more metering is being done for diesel. Right now, every single A-grade building, even now that we're talking of achieving net zero, is using generators. And I walked around Melrose here, and for the first time, I could smell diesel in the air. Many years back, this wasn't the situation. It is what it is. Solution right now is that until we are able to invest in renewable energy, solar in particular, we will continue to have uh, tenants who are unhappy and would keep moving to B grade buildings or would keep reducing uh, the size of space that they take at the end of the day. Great, you did well. Uh, nice executive summary, Benga, thanks so much. Um, we've, we're running out of time, but very quickly, Michael, you need to tell us how Kofisi is integrating hospitality into uh, the office segment. Yeah, great. Um, thanks very much for asking that question because it's, um, it's a really important part of, of what we're doing. Um, and we've, we've done this on purpose in terms of bringing hospitality into the, into the space. S s uh, shared workspace is about service, ultimately. And as, a, as an outsourcer um, providing enterprise solutions, when you think about what that actually means is we actually have to provide a cheaper service and, and a much better, a cheaper product and a much better service. That's what outsourcing is about. Um, we do that by producing and, and delivering very large spaces with customized, customized offices. So customization is, is the way to attract people in, but hospitality is the way to their heart. So we think there's a vital part of the product and we think it's a really exciting area of change around, around, this, around this service provision. And it's something that we're really focused on um, because service is ultimately the technical delivery, but hospitality is what actually drives a great experience. And we want them to have that every day. Fantastic. Thank you so much. In 30 seconds, Nicholas, can you tell us the data uh, that you're currently con uh, collecting that informs uh, the strategic uh, decisions that you're making when it comes to uh, occupier lease uh, occupation leases um, of and general investment decisions, you know, in, in, in offices? So, again, a difficult question to answer in 30 seconds, but uh, we have a lot of data on our hands because we have so many clients in uh, corporate real estate. Uh, I think key is your employee satisfaction. Uh, we're starting to collect a lot of that data. That's a priority for your portfolio managers. Um, and health and safety. I mean, we've all been through it. Uh, and, and the ability to know about your presence, how you're managing all of that, it's, it's absolutely key, and compliance as well. Um, so those, those are some of the, some of the key yeah. points there. Thanks. Yeah. And I can imagine how a lot of this data becomes very useful to would-be developers, seeing what's, what's important to occupiers, what's not important to them, you know, and, and then take it out of the next project. Brilliant. Um, Abdul, in your own context, what kind of technology or you know, green features are you bringing in? Uh, Michael's talked about you know, looking at it from a hospitality perspective. Um, what, what features are you adding to your co-working uh, to make it more attractive to occupiers? So we, 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 we introduced various um, things to, to, to our space to, 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 to bring in our clientele um, to our space. So our offering, uh, once again, needs to be uh, a good and we need to adjust our offering. So what we do is we, um, we incentivize, you know, and by incentivizing, we become more flexible and we do not hold you to, um, 
to, 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 to take down your contract for a year or two years. So we give you that option to, to actually uh, walk into our space, make yourself comfortable, and then we take it on ourselves to actually introduce to you what is our space about and what we have to offer and make you stay. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, everyone has this document on their chairs. If you look at it, my colleagues at Northcott prepared this. And this big chat is essentially a mobility trend. Um, we use a, a tool that is free by Google. Um, essentially, Google, you know, just tracking using everyone that has their location settings on. Thank you so much. Uh, so we, Google shares that data, aggregates that data, and is able to tell where people are at every point in time. So there are already locations that are already tagged residential. There are locations that, that they know is, re, is recreational. There are locations that I know is offices and all. So with that data, you can tell where people are. You know, and this is the data for Nigeria over here. And just looking at this, from 2021, you can see that white line is offices. And you can see that white line has now gone all the way up. So that just generally tells us a lot of things that these panelists have told us, but with actual data, that more people are now back in the offices as against, I think this is June 2021 when the white line was all the way down and now people are back in the office all the way in June 2022. So great panel, great discussions, great insights. Thank you so much.